Thank you so much, Russ. Good morning. Welcome to our Epiphany worship, second Sunday of Epiphany as our, as our new year um, gets up to speed. We are uh, very pleased to welcome you and a number of guests as well, and also you who are listening from home today on your radios or televisions. It's good to be with you as we worship God together. We want to thank those leading our service today. We thank Tracy Beeger for playing her flute today. We thank our praise team, Russ Bunker, our director of music, and those reading, praying, and serving as ushers today. We express our sympathy today. Dayton Jacobson, long-term member of Calvary, died this week, and we will have his funeral Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. here at Calvary. He is the father to Shirley Richter, Carolyn Taragawa, and Jan Christensen, all three members here at Calvary, and uh, was was an important figure early in Calvary's life in a number, a number of ways. So we're, we're, uh, we're sorry to lose Dayton. I think 92 are very close to it. Next Sunday at 12 noon, we will have our second annual meeting. This is a meeting that particularly look us, looks at our financial situation, closes our books for the year. We have a very nice problem in that we ended our year with a $20,000 surplus. And so we have a really hard job of deciding what to do with that, whether we put it into the budget for next year or whether we send Phil on another trip because it was pretty nice to be without him for a while. But we also know that we've added a second pastor here at Calvary, so we need to ramp up our giving to keep growing. So that gives, could give us a little seed money for our next year, too. So um, 12 noon next Sunday, we need a quorum, so it would be great if you could come and join us. I don't think it'll take very long. We have a new group of new members joining Calvary in February. We'd love to talk to you about being part of that group if you're ready to take another step in your commitment here. Pastor Cassie and her husband Jacob are still in Israel leading a Holy Land trip for a group of 18 to 30-year-olds. I don't know if that's heaven or hell, <laughs> but, but I think it's great training for what we're asking her to do here, so we're delighted. Her installation as pastor here at Calvary will be February 1st with someone from the Synod here to do that. I'm back from my three my three-week sabbatical, the last of my three months. So we look forward to getting our year underway at Calvary with lots of energy. It's kind of in the air, isn't it, after New Year passes. We thank lots of new council members for joining us with new ideas and excitement for mission here. So let's take a moment now to prepare ourselves for our worship. Please stand as you are able for the order of confession and forgiveness. For the well-being of all, all God's children, we confess our sins before God and one another. Faithful teacher, as we become fully immersed into a new year, we ask your forgiveness for those things that we have done and have failed to do that bring harm to you, others, and ourselves. Cleanse us from our sin and transform us by your forgiveness. Amen. Our Lord Jesus walked on this earth to bring forgiveness and new life to all. In Jesus' name, I proclaim to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. Today you are made new by the abundant love of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing together, win in our music, God is glorified.
how can we help but say to that, Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. pray together. Lord Jesus, you prove to be a formidable foe for the tempter. Give us strength to resist the temptations of this world and rejoice in the heavenly gifts promised to all who follow you. For the glory of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated and we will hear Tracy Beeger and Russ Bunker do It Is Well With My Soul.
I know we've got some kids out here that I would love to have come up here for the children's sermon. Good enough. It's the 8.30 service, and we've got some kids here. It's all right. To tell you just a little story about that song, All Is Well With My Soul, um, that, that was written by a man after he lost his wife and daughters in a shipwreck. And to be able to say, All Is Well With My Soul, after that is a very powerful thing. Okay, you kids. All right, we got one more. The pride of, of, uh, of Long Lake is coming up here now. All right. Probably his first time at the children's sermon. Is it? Oh, good. Well, it's awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you about a kind of a big word, but then I'm going to tell a little story. So do you... Do you kids know about temptation? You ever heard that word? It's a pretty big word. Temptation. Do you know about cookie jars? <laughs> Do you know about cookie jars? You know, I was trying to come up with one, but we don't really have a cookie jar at our house anymore. Anybody else have a cookie jar? Did you grow up with a cookie jar? Okay. Well, you kids, you need to know that, that when I was growing up as a little kid, and we were a pretty big family. There were eight of us and seven boys, and we could eat cookies. Man, we could go through a whole bunch of cookies really fast. Do you like cookies? You like cookies? All right, yeah. If you, if you don't, you're crazy. No, it's... <laughs> we love cookies. We like cookies. So anyway, when my mom would make cookies... We usually, actually, she kind of let us have the burned ones first. Has that ever happened at your house? The burned ones were kind of free cookies. But then maybe we could have a cookie. And then the extra cookie she made, what do you suppose she did with those cookies? She put them in the cookie jar. And I don't know where yours was. Ours was up on top of the refrigerator. So for a little kid, that was like, was like clear up there. It was really high. And the rule was that we had to wait for, you know, we'd have, there'd be, there'd be a treat maybe in the middle of the afternoon or the middle of the morning when we could have cookies when they were offered to us. But otherwise, the cookie jar was kind of off limits. You know what that would mean? Okay. No eating out of the cookie jar between meals. Well, how do you think that felt for a little kid? I could just feel those cookies up there, and they were calling to me. And so there were a couple of times that I climbed up on the cupboard and reached clear up to grab the cookie jar to steal some cookies. It's not something your pastor should be admitting to you, but I did that. And one time... I even knocked it off the refrigerator. And even cookies don't taste very good with shards of cookie jar kind of all around them. So I got in pretty serious trouble about that. So that's really what temptation is about, that there are things that aren't very good for us that we'd really like to do. Now, I don't know if that's true for you kids, but I, I, I bet it is. Maybe it's to... Maybe it's to um, um, kind of break the rules at school a little bit to be talking in class or something or maybe it's maybe it's um, staying up late or I don't know what it is at your house but but there are things that 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 our parents ask us to do or our teachers ask us to do and sometimes we don't really want to do them so that's called temptation and we're going to hear more about Jesus temptation but this Jesus felt those temptations too Jesus was a kid and felt those temptations. But Jesus can help us to say, you know what, I think that I could wait until lunchtime to have a cookie and to resist the temptations that come to us. When you get bigger, the temptations get bigger. Tax season, is, some of us would like to cheat on our taxes. We don't like to pay so much tax. There are all sorts of temptations that grow up with us. So it's not just little people that have cookie jars of some sort. But we believe that God helps us to resist our temptations. So can we pray together? 
Lord God, we thank you for cookies and so many good things that you have made. Help us when we are so drawn or attracted or tempted by things that are not good for us, that you would help us to say no to those things. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up here today. You have a great day. We'll continue with the reading. The Old Testament lesson this morning is Psalm 91. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 on your right hand, but it will not come near you. For you only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No scourge come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Lost my step here. On your hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able for the gospel acclamation. Today's gospel lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. A reading from, a reading from Matthew. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, He withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light 
And for those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began, began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The word of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. First of all, I do want to say how grateful I am for the sabbatical time that you've given me. In three segments, the last one, these three weeks since Christmas, I've had time off to read and think, travel and write, slow down and rest and catch up with my kids and myself. I had three segments of three months total and I am very grateful. I split them up to kind of make them a little more convenient for our schedule here. I'm grateful to Pastor Cassie and to Pastor Steve and Carl and our other staff and leaders for covering for me and grateful to all of you for supporting this time. I've, uh, you know what burnt out means? Do you know what crispy means? It's not burnt out, but it's a little, a little crispy. And I, uh, I have to say that a sabbatical is, is what people have always known turns people from crispy to frisky. <laughs> so I hope, um, I, I think it was Lee Mindeman that was, was telling that he, uh, he wished that had been available to him in his career. So I hope for, for all of you, you have a chance for Sabbath. For those of you who know me well, this is no great revelation, but I tend to get frantic to hurry up with all the things that can be done, neglecting others, my own self-care, and some of the finer things in life, like slowing down to really listen to people and to God. I'm tempted to hurry up, and then I miss some things to which I really should pay more attention. This sabbatical and a second pastor here are a great help with this temptation of mine. So it's many years ago now, but I traveled to Mexico with a group of Concordia faculty and students. I'm pretty experienced at it, as gringos go, after 40 trips to Latin America. My Spanish is pretty good, but there are times I just didn't get it. One day we were heading downtown in Guadalajara, Mexico, on public transportation. So we walked from our hotel to the bus stop. And we asked at the bus stop, it's kind of a helpful thing, to get some assistance. You know, what's, what's the bus line? It's not quite as clear there in Mexico as some other places. Not such clear signage about how do I, how do I get downtown from here. So a couple people stepped up and helped us take this number bus. We're going there too, so you just follow us and we'll get you, get you there okay. We trusted them, and I didn't think much at the time of some little bit uncomfortable glances from people around us. And then on the bus, a couple more kind of uncomfortable glances that I didn't quite understand what was going on. And then suddenly we realized that out of our group of about six, three of us had had our pockets picked and those people were gone. And it was a group of four people that were a crew and they picked us out as chumps and led us down a primrose path and then proceeded to rob us and get away scot-free. Now, I don't want to put down Mexico. Mary Sue got her pocket picked in Denmark. <laughs> it can happen. And the way it's most likely to happen is when you're in a kind of unfamiliar place where you don't catch those kind of cues about what's going on. If I'd been more aware of how the bus worked, I'd have done better. But certainly those people that looked a little uncomfortable, they were trying to kind of help me out without getting in trouble themselves. And it just, it just went right past me until it was too late. Now in a normal sermon about temptation, I'd beat up those robbers, right? Shame on them. Their grandmas would not be pleased with them. That was a bad thing they did. But you know, we're not that tempted to be robbers, I don't think. But what I want to say today 
is that we are being robbed constantly, right here and right now. And I don't mean by our stewardship committee. <laughs> and we don't even know that it's happening. We are being tempted to live a life that we never wanted, to live a life without God, and we aren't even aware that it's happening. We are missing the signs of that robbery. We are being tempted away from a vocation of love and service to another kind of life, a life of accumulation, a life of isolation, and we seldom even notice that we've been robbed. So I think the biggest challenge of temptation is realizing when we're being tempted because often we miss it entirely. So I don't know if it's okay to say this. I'm just back. I'd hate to get thrown out so quickly. But I'm kind of jealous of Jesus in this story because I think there are some ways he has it easier than we do. Because it's certainly clear in this story that he is being tempted. And we usually don't even know it. I think our biggest problem with temptation is we don't know we're being tempted. Our pockets are being picked and we are not even aware. I did quite a bit of reading on my sabbatical and it's interesting, one of the things that I found was was a book by my college roommate that I didn't even know he had written. Ken Halstead was his name. And he wrote a book called From Stuck to Unstuck, Overcoming Congregational Impasse. He's a pastor too. And here's what he says. Evil may be wrong, but it's not stupid. At least not at its most powerful. It does not deal in honest, straightforward, and fair competition. It fights dirty and deceptively, using every clever, double-binding trick to trap us and rob us of our humanity and our eternal birthright. Evil plays dirty. And the worst is when we're robbed of our vocations, too. I don't know if you know the word proof text, Proof text is what we use to say that you take a verse from here and a verse from here and a verse from here. You can prove almost anything. The devil is proof texting here. And I think one of our ways to avoid missing the point is to look at a verse in its context. And if you look at what Matthew is doing here in these first chapters, he's setting up this story in a very straight line from the announcement of Jesus' birth to Joseph, to the birth, the wise men. Then we have the baptism. And finally, we come here to the temptation and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's all about a straight path to lead Jesus into his vocation, his calling to preach the kingdom. If you remember at the baptism, as Jesus is touched by the water, he is called beloved son of God and given a mission to accomplish. And in the last verses of today's gospel reading, this is a little longer gospel reading than we usually have about the temptation. It also includes the beginning of Jesus' ministry. I think that's so appropriate because it's all lined up in a row. Jesus begins his vocation at the, in these last verses. He still doesn't know exactly where this vocation will take him, only that he is to start by telling the good news of God's gracious love right in his own neighborhood. That is his calling. It's going to lead him to the cross as that straight line continues. And it started at his baptism as our vocation does. So in that straight line, I think the real story of, of this vocation, of this temptation, is to bump Jesus 
off that trail, often by some pretty good things. These aren't terrible, terrible things Jesus is being tempted by. They're some pretty good things. But they will all push him and distract him away from this ministry that God is calling him to. That is our greatest temptation too, I believe. To get sidetracked and distracted and to miss what God really calls us to do. Somehow we can get waylaid on our journey and not end up where God wanted us to be at all. And finally, to get sidetracked away from God's own self. The very heart of temptation is that they seem to be good things. Would you be tempted to go out and kill a bunch of people in a post office or something today? I don't think that would be very tempting to you. I think it's more a cookie jar, isn't it? It's something that sounds pretty darn good. From the beginnings of the Garden of Eden to Jesus' temptation and ours, the liar, the slanderer, those are the words that are used for the devil here, entice us with things that appear to be good, not with things that appear to be evil. The way the slanderer seeks to change our wills is by lying, by stretching the truth, even quoting Scripture. Generally, the slanderer entices us not to do great evil acts, but to do good things for the wrong reasons. None of Jesus' temptations were to do anything grossly evil, but to do good things for the wrong reasons or at the wrong time. What's wrong with turning stones into bread to feed the hungry? That sounds like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? If one can do it. Later, Jesus will turn a couple of fish and five loaves of bread into a feast for 5,000. What's wrong with believing Scripture so strongly that he trusts the angels to protect him? We've sung that song on eagle's wings that quotes from Psalm 81. We trust that God will save us from all danger. What's wrong with Jesus trusting God for that? Later, Jesus will walk on water perhaps slightly less difficult than floating on air. What's wrong with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords assuming control over the kingdoms of the world? Isn't that what we expect at the end of the age? In about 350 A.D., when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian and turned the whole Roman Empire to be Christian, wasn't that what everyone had dreamed would happen? I'm not sure it turned out all that well. But it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so after these three temptations, we get a picture in our mind's eye of Jesus making a choice between some very attractive alternatives and staying on this track of God's will, of perceiving that these okay choices did not move him toward God's future and God's kingdom. How do we keep our perceptions sharp? How do we notice when we're getting our pocket picked or we're getting pushed off the path? Well, after being robbed a couple of times, I've learned to be more aware of my surroundings and the threats there. Actually, I've had my pocket picked three times, so I'm kind of a slow learner. <laughs> but, but, um, but still, you know, we do learn when we make mistakes, don't we? But that's kind of a tough way to learn, isn't it? During my sabbatical, I began to take my own self-care and exercise more seriously. I think a lot of people do after, after the new year and those few extra pounds from Christmas treats. It's easy to neglect those things. As most of you know, it is by the regular practice or exercise of our bodies that we keep them healthy and strong. Many of you are very, very serious about that. And just so it is by regular exercise of our spiritual practices that we keep our perceptions on track. 
For the Jews, the Sabbath was a very important practice that helped them distinguish themselves from the other people around them and know who they are. There's a very interesting phrase that says, the Sabbath has been more likely to save the Jews than it has been the Jews that have saved the Sabbath. So practice and practices are important as we refine our perceptions to know what's really going on, what is temptation and what is not. We Christians also have some practices that we need to regularly exercise to keep ourselves sharp. During my sabbatical, I read a great book by Dorothy Bass called Practicing Our Faith. I think it would be a great book, a book club, um, book group reading here as it looks at a variety of different practices, different authors, chapters on spiritual practices like keeping Sabbath, forgiveness, hospitality, singing, worship, household economics, and even taking care of our bodies. We have to practice to be strong and to recognize and combat the temptations that come to us. Another book I read, The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. Just a wonderful book that nails what I think is our greatest temptation in America. If you travel around the world very much, other countries are very quick to see how tied up we are with our money. Lynn Twist observes that in American culture, three things are true, three things. First, more is better. Second, we prove ourselves by how much we have. And third, there's nothing we can do to change it. We're just stuck with the way it is, and we can't change our life or the way our culture works. These messages are everywhere around us, and it's so hard not to be pulled in. In fact, we usually don't even know we are being tempted to buy this whole package. We just think that's the way it is and should be. More is better is very tempting. Think of Christmas, the pressure to buy and buy, to get yourself in debt for the sake of buying, and often losing the heart of Christmas. I think it's probably particularly hard for some of us who are a little older to look at our kids and grandkids to see just how powerful this is to have the next new cell phone or iPod and just feel they are so left out if they don't have the right clothes or the right electronics that their friends have. But are we really so different? Aren't we all so pulled in in lots of ways? Think of the rat race we usually live in, the endless pressure to keep up with others, to have a nice house and car and all the toys. Those are not bad things in themselves. None of those things are bad things in themselves. God wants us to have food, shelter, and clothing. But what if the quest for things takes over everything and pushes us off the track that God has chosen for us? Off the track of our calling from God. January and the New Year is a time when many folks take a look at their lives and find they are not content with the way things are. This is a time of all sorts of New Year's resolutions. Hopefully they're not all just about weight and exercise. But all is not well. We have been lured off the track of life with God and we haven't even realized it. We may have some cues that all is not well, but like me at the bus stop and on the bus, I may not really get what's happening to me. That the very life that I want to lead is being robbed from me. Another example is that in the last 10 to 15 years, many have observed that what we call regular attendance at worship has radically changed. The very definition of that phrase, regular attendance, which used to mean 
every Sunday. And today, if they do a survey, many, many people, most even, would say once a month. Now, I have a vested interest to have people here, so I'm probably not the best advocate for this, but the truth is, how are you going to refine your perceptions and sensitivity about what is temptation unless you practice and exercise it? Where are the places that we can learn? What leads us on the path that Jesus wants us? And what leads us away? Here and in other spiritual practices, we learn not to be robbed of the abundant life God promises by the temptations that surround us. Here we find our true vocations as children of God called to love and serve God and our neighbors. As the slanderer, as the liar, attempted with such not not such bad things, to tempt Jesus off the track that would take him on his course to serve God's people and finally even to give his life for us. We also are constantly being bumped off the track. People of God, let Jesus help you to stay on the path that leads to life. Cultivate in this new year those practices that help you sharpen your perceptions to see what's really happening around you. In Jesus' baptism and in ours, God called us his children, promised his unconditional love, and deputized us to be his people in the world. Don't let yourselves be distracted and waylaid. Don't get robbed. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we confess the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you with our great need. We ask that you would be with us. Most of all, that you would help us keep on a straight path following our Lord Jesus. For it is there that you give us the abundant life and finally life forever. Lord God, we pray for the family, for Shirley and Carolyn and Jan as they bury their father, Dayton, this week. Be with Della and all of their family as they grieve their dad. Lord, we entrust him into your gracious and loving arms. Lord, as we go into this new year, we ask that you would be with those of our people in particular need. We have many that are facing serious illness and even death. Lord God, we pray for our people who are suffering from the cold, from hunger. We pray that you would continue to help us to fight Ebola. Lots of problems in our world today, Lord. We ask that you would help us to use our best gifts from you to make this world the place that you want it to be. We pray this in your name. Amen. As members of God's household, I pray the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share the peace with one another. Take your time and then we will receive the offering.
this time we're going to go directly to the words of institution. As we come to the communion, we, um, we invite all of you to come to the Lord's table. We commune, um, we commune uh, with, with our cups. As you, as you are heading back, you will want to drop your cup there. We're going to kneel at the, at the rail. Please follow the directions of your ushers. Our Lord Jesus, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. Please stand. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God come for all is ready. You may be seated. And for the closing blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Lord, keep us on the path as you feed us with your heavenly body and blood. We know that it is for nourishment on our journey. So Lord, keep us moving with you and toward you. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.